It's 703 and we're going to start. I do not see a minister, but just because we do not have any ministers in the audience, we're still going to pray. We're going to pray before we start this, this uh, meeting. So would everyone please bow their heads. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you with bowed heads and humble hearts. Lord, we come with thanksgiving in our hearts. Lord, we thank you for this meeting. Lord, we thank you for these citizens, these concerned citizens that have come out tonight to be educated so that they will know their rights. Lord, our prayer is that something will be said in this meeting that will help each of us, the citizens and law enforcement, to make this Odessa a better community. And then, Lord, when we leave here, give us traveling grace so that we will reach our final destination safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, thank y'all for coming. This is our third leg of our uh, five uh, series of workshops. We think it's a very important um, workshop, and you think it's important, too, because you're here. We have a lot of distinguished guests that are here tonight. We, uh, in planning this workshop, we want it to be equipped. We want it to have all of the players in the room so that we would be able to address your needs and answer all of your questions. We have um, Attorney Gavin Norris who is walking to the back. We have um, Art Leal who is one of the, also one of the organ, org, organizers of this workshop. Um, and at this time we're going to have some opening remarks by Art. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, very much. <laughs> Um, I can't stress enough how important these uh, community meetings are and um, why we have to have them. A couple of months ago, we committed as a community to begin, to begin sustained conversations with law enforcement and educate our community on the rights, uh, on our rights when we interact with law enforcement and get a better understanding of our legal system. The process has started and we are moving forward. I want to say that law enforcement has a tough job. Uh, every day, they get put in situations where they have to make decisions. Uh, we appreciate what they do. <coughs> so, we are very happy for the leaders that we have today. Uh, we continue the process of having honest conversations to try to determine uh, what issues there are and how we can address them proactively. Uh, if we work hard, we can make sure that police officers and the communities they serve are partners in our community, making sure everybody feels safe and we build confidence and trust. So with that, I'll hand it over to Gavin. Uh, good evening. My comments will be brief because you will hear from me more than probably some of you want to this evening. But we thank you once again for being here. Um, for the, uh, Chief Burton, the police officer, uh, all the attorneys on the panel as well here. So we thank you all for your participation. I want to acknowledge a few people here. Um, we have a lot of students here. So if you go to Permian, will you stand up for us? <coughs> I wanted, they had some incentive to come, but it's important we, when we've had these meetings before, we've said it's the young people, it's the young people. And I think sometimes we miss the mark when we come to these meetings and we talk to folks who say it doesn't apply to me. We know tonight everyone at one point has interacted or been pulled over by the police. Right, and whether you thought it was justified or unjustified, you've been pulled over. We're glad to have our students here because it's important that they know uh, as much as this, and, and it's important for us to make sure that we're inviting them to come to these meetings. Uh, as much as it applies to us, it applies to them as well. So thank you again. Thank you, Gavin. <laughs> and before we go any further, there's some housekeeping items, issues that I didn't discuss. If you have a cell phone, please turn it off because we don't want to be interrupted by our ring cell, cell phone. And please don't talk on it, please. Everyone should have picked up a, a questionnaire at the front table. Please complete it. Hmm. Please complete the questionnaire. And then there are uh, index cards at the front table. If you have comments or questions, please fill these out, hold them up. We'll come pick them up and then we'll address each question. Um, we are very big on respect. We're going to respect you and you're going to respect us. And by us respecting each other, we can have a nice meeting. If you have something to say, hold your hand up. We'll acknowledge you and we'll let you speak. 
Uh, our district attorney, Bobby Bland, is out of town. He told us at the last, last month's meeting he would not be here. But we have two representatives from the district attorney's office. Justin Cunningham, would you stand? And Clay George. These are representatives from the district attorney's office. Thank you all. Thank you all. Also, uh, Cassie Champion is with the Texas Civil Rights Project. Cassie, would you stand? Thank you. And uh, our police chief is here, and he has uh, several staff members, and I'm going to let him do the introductions and the presentations of his staff. Chief. Thank you, Joanne. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your lives to, to come and, and work with us this evening. Uh, here tonight are, are my two deputy chiefs, uh, Lou Wars and Mike Gerke, uh, and our uh, communications officer, uh, Corporal Steve Lesware. Um, over there, as well as our police attorney, Felice Avalos, uh, who's here to uh, answer your questions as well. Um, we, we have prepared a couple of things. One is we have a short video. The, the gentleman from Parks is uh, returning with a cord to make it operate. Apparently, he can't make it work right now. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to that, and it's, it's, a, it's a traffic stop. It's a simulated traffic stop, and it explains the, the roles of each party. Um, and uh, Corporal LeSueur also has uh, some information on ride-alongs. Uh, he has uh, some information, abbreviated information, like a flyer if people are interested. And we also have detailed information for how folks can ride along with the police, what's entailed, and who you need to contact in order to make that happen. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> I think we need to address some, con con some concerns or some uh, <clears throat> ideas or the reason for these workshops is that we know what's happened all over the United States. We know what happened in New York. We know what happened in Ferguson. We know what happened in Florida. Things are happening all around us. The reason for these workshops is we want you, the citizens, to be educated. We want you to know your rights. We're not here to point fingers at law enforcement because they're law enforcement. I think they've been trained to do their job. But when you don't have two people that are communicating correctly, you have a problem. So we, we're here tonight because we want to know what they know so that when they stop us, we know what we can and cannot do. We don't want to take anything for granted. If you've been here first two times, Attorney Gavin Norris, oh, this is his saying. We want you here to tell your side of the story. Because if you make an incorrect move, you may not be here to tell your story. <laughs> but if you're educated, you'll be here to tell your story. Okay. Um, I picked out a few volunteers. And if you will, to, I'm going to move around <coughs> tonight. If you've come to the, the past couple of these, um, you see, this has been more of a lecture style, so we're gonna. This, uh, it, this tonight requires involvement from everybody. So I want to give you that up front. So if you thought you were gonna come and rest, uh, you can rest, but not too much. All right. So if I, my four volunteers, if you guys will come up here, you ladies, please, and thank you. Well, while they're coming up. Huh? A hundred points? A hundred points, yeah. Boy, you better teach me than I am, because I don't... Oh. Go ahead, have a seat. Have a seat in these, these four chairs for me. I had to get them here somewhere. Man, had to get them. Yeah. They needed it. They needed it. So, real quick, just by a show of hands, we gave you a, a um, this flyer when you came in. So, just show, uh, a show of hands, yes, if, if you think this is right. And we're just going to poll everybody. If you think the police can stop you for any reason, raise your hand. Okay? If you think that the police can make the driver, that yes, they can make the driver get out of the vehicle, raise your hand. If, if you believe that the police can make everyone get out of a car, once the car is stopped, raise your hand. If you think that the driver is the only person who's detained, or the, only, the driver's the only person who's stopped, raise your hand. 
The next question, can the, do you, can the police take you to jail for speeding? Raise your hand if that's yes. For speeding. When they pull you over, they say, you've been speeding, you know, we, we pulled you over. You say, you know what, I'm not signing that ticket, right? There's other criminals out here. Why are you messing with me, right? People robbing and killing folks, and you pull me over. I was only going two miles over, right? You say, I'm not signing the ticket. Can they take you to jail if you don't sign the ticket? Yes or no? Yes? Yes. OK. Can they take you to jail for not wearing your, your seat belt? Can they search your vehicle at any time during the stop? No. Go back to the seatbelt. Go back to the seatbelt? <laughs> we'll get there. We'll go back to that. Can the police arrest you for anything? Let's say, for instance, you had a, um, you didn't use your turn signal. Can they arrest you for not using your turn signal? No. OK. Do they need, if, if they pull you over and, say, and they end up searching your car, they say you have something in the trunk. They want to search the trunk, but the trunk is locked. Do they need a search warrant to search your trunk? Yes, raise your hand, yes. Can the police force you to take a breathalyzer test? No. No. I think I put that on there twice. Is it a, can they draw your blood? Is that okay? No? Okay. Not without warrant. It gives us a good understanding of where we are. I have these, my four folks here, right? They're driving in a car. This is a family, the mother, her friend, and her two daughters, right? Beautiful family. All right. <laughs> Take a picture, post for a frame. So here's, here's what we know. You're driving down the street. You see some flashing lights behind you, right? You pull over, hopefully, right? You don't keep going. You pull over. What's the, what's the first thing that happens? Oh, a high school student. Love it. The sweet symphonic sound of young, beautiful voices. Say it again for me. Well, not your, not your registration, because where's your registration? Your insurance, right? License and insurance. What's the next thing that happens? We all know. We've, we've been here. What's the next thing that happens? They ask you if you know why you got pulled over. Do you know why you get pulled over? Let me stop here. Do they have to have a valid reason? And I'll facilitate this with some folks here. What, what reasons can they have to stop you? What are the reasons that they can stop you? Oh, they say probable cause. What is, oh, probable cause? That's such a legal term. What is probable cause? That's reasonable. Hold on, say it for me just a minute. Go ahead. Reasonable evidence. You committed a crime or a traffic violation. Reasonable evidence. Let me go to my attorneys here. What is probable cause? Any one of you. Probable cause. PC. Not necessarily evidence, but it's higher than reasonable suspicion. Um, it's a, a probable <coughs> suspicion that, they, that you have committed a crime or been involved in criminal activity. What does that consist of? Because, you know, we're everyday folks. Right, we don't. We some of us went to law school. Right, we paid all that money for an education. We used a little bit every day, right? But but for 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 us folks who who've never been to law school, what does it mean in regular folks' terms? What does it mean, Chief? Probable cause, and I'll try and put it in regular folks' terms, is essentially what a reasonable person uh, understands to have taken place based upon the information that's available to them right then and there. So if the information available to you would seem to indicate that there is a likelihood that the person was involved in criminal activity, specific criminal activity, then that's probable cause. Thank you. And I'll give it to you this. If you break the law, or it's likely, or it appears that you break the law, that's probable cause. All right? That, that's, that's, a, that's Gavin's definition. All right, the Chiefs was better. All right. So here we go. You have a broken tail light. You don't use uh, you don't use your turn signal. You don't have a uh, your 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 seat belt on. That's probable cause. All right. Probable cause. How many of you guys said that you believe that if you don't have your turn signal on, you don't have your seat belt, that they can take you to jail? Was that a yes? No. No. 
Felice, all right, Attorney Felice, can you go to jail for not having, can, does the officer have the authority to take you to jail for not wearing your seatbelt or for a traffic violation? Many traffic violations, yes. Speeding, no. Seatbelt, no. Open container. Open container. Open container. So no seatbelt, yes. Here's the deal. There are only two things. There are only two things that police officers are required to give you a ticket for. There are only two things that are required to give you a ticket. That's speeding and that's open container. What's open container? If you have alcohol and it's in a cup, you know those red Dixie cups with the lines, right? Or you have some alcohol, right? And the seal is broken off. <laughs> or you have any alcohol and it looks like it might have been open or some of it's gone, that's open container. That's open container. Speeding. There's a common misconception that you can go to jail for speeding. Here's what the law says. You can't go to jail for speeding, but what can you go to jail for if you're speeding? Excessive. Reckless, 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 Reckless driving. Reckless driving. Reckless driving. Hold on, just a minute. I just wanted you to clear up the open container. Go ahead, I'll let you go ahead. Go ahead. Now, is it considered an open container if you had like a trash sack full of crushed aluminum beer cans in the car? Is that still an open container? His, his question was if you have crushed <coughs> aluminum cans in the car, right? They're, they're yeah. empty. Yeah, they're empty. Empty Budweiser crushed cans. aluminum cans in the car. Is that an open container? I'll, I'll start turn it over to our panel. Or even bottles that you're taking to recycle. Or, or, or empty bottles. Is that an open container? They shouldn't be in within, within reach though. Why? Well, because who knows when those bottles were emptied. You could have drank a whole trash bag full of bottles. They should, the yeah, whole trash bag. I'd be swerving pretty good. Yeah, if you couldn't tell he was that drunk. When you guys see this come across your case, uh, come, come across uh, your docket and your files, what, what do you guys turn on? Yes, this is open container. No, it's not open container. Well, I, I would say with open container, a lot of the officers at the scene have a lot of, uh, you know, what, what is it? Is it trash or is it actually something that is being consumed? Or, excuse me? You can't, you can't hear me? I'm sorry. Uh, I think as far as open container uh, is concerned, I think officers have a lot of discretion when they're at the scene, if they're at the car, and they see it. I mean, is it something that appears that it was just open? Does it appear that it's trash? I mean, I think there's a lot of, you know, individual case assessment that has to be done by the officer at that time, and uh, it's something that when we get the file, of course, we're going to look at it and we're going to tell, you know, is it really trash or is it pure that he was uh, or she had it open and it was going to consume it? I think it's, it's not a, a black or white type of issue when you look at open containers to see if, you know, how it meets. So I think there's a bright line rule to say, you know, yes or no uh, on that set of facts. I think you're going to have to, to look, and like you said, if it's going, you know, a trash can, it's crushed aluminum cans or you know, you're going to recycle. I think that's, that's something that an officer would take into account at the scene at that moment in time. If we go to our driver, right, the, the officer pulls our driver over for, for speeding, he gives her the ticket, and she says, I'm not going to sign the ticket. Can he then take her to jail? He did. Yes? Who believes they can take him, take him to jail? Chief, what does the law say about not signing a ticket? Right. The law you down. They did. Hold on, Chief, 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 Chief. I, we only got one chief in the room. We only got one chief. We only got one chief. And he's sitting up here. Chief. Uh, you, you, you have to sign the ticket. It's a, it's a criminal violation not to do so, and it is a principal offense uh, not to sign. And remember, by signing, you're not acknowledging anything. You're simply acknowledging that you're being given this, this summons to court, this date on which you must appear. However, the law does require you to sign. Here's, here's put it from kind of the, the lawyer perspective. is this, your, your ticket... On your ticket, it's a promise that you're going to appear in court. When you sign it, that's what your promise is. So when you fail to sign, so it's like a bond. All right, it's like a bond. And when you fail to sign it, you're, you're basically saying, I'm not promising you that I'm going to appear. And since you're not promising to appear, they can take you to jail. They can take you to jail. Okay, that's what the, that's what the statute says. 
Cassie, if you will, attorney champion. We have another thing what we call Terry stops, because we get this question all the time. Well, I was just driving down the street, and they didn't have any reason. They, I was just driving down the street in the neighborhood, and they pulled me over. I wasn't doing anything wrong, right? We have a thing which we call Terry stops, which we'll focus about vehicles here, and the next one we'll focus on if you're just walking down the street. But attorney champion, can you explain what a Terry stop is, how it works? important to note the levels of interaction that you have with an officer. The first one is consensual or conversational. The second one is if you're detained in any way. The third one is arrest. So Terry stops fall into the second one, detention. Um, the officer does have the right to, even if you're in a car, detain you for a reasonable amount of time. And they do have to have a reason to pull you over, even if it's a minor traffic violation. Um, that's, that's considered um, fine, and it's, it's a detention for a short amount of time, but that could be, it could take a while. It could be long enough for them to run your license, make sure you don't have any warrants and things like that. Um, and there are some things that you have to answer, right, when you are interacting with an officer who has stopped you in your vehicle. You have, of course, you have to give your ID. Um, and then there's different obligations for the passengers in the car. Are we gonna get to that part? We are gonna get to passengers here yeah, next. Yeah. Um, is there any specific Thing. If it goes up beyond a reasonable amount of time, you're probably looking at something that is that is not um, a Terry stop. Or just what is simple. reasonable? What, yeah, yeah, right, what you're giving reasonable. us some legal terminology, reasonable. Yeah. What does that mean? What does what reasonable actually mean? Well, as long as it would take for them to determine if, you know, you ha if they have reasonable suspicion beyond the minor traffic violation that you've been stopped for, that you were somehow involved in a crime, if they keep you for longer than it would take them to determine if you've been part of what they suspect you of, then then it's probably unreasonable. Two can hours. I keep you for can I keep you for two hours? You know, I also don't know if there's a bright line rule. I don't think that, that I think two hours would be unreasonable if they don't have any further suspicion. Can I keep you for thirty minutes? If it help me out, please. If it, it takes that long to run exactly. your plates and you have to have a purpose? And you've got to have two things, a purpose and time to do that, to complete the purpose. Whenever they're deciding how long is reasonable for a detention, they take into consideration, they being the court um, and appeals court and, and officers, how long, is a how long is a detention reasonable? It's when they have a purpose and how long it's gonna take them to reach that purpose. They're meaning they have to be actively involved in an investigation while you're sitting there. They need to be doing their best to get the information that they need in the, in a short amount of time. There is actually no bright line. The courts have consistently refused to set a bright line. They will not say this is too long or this is long enough. Um, so you could perhaps be two hours. And one thing I've seen looking at case law as far as from the courts, I've seen courts say that 10 minutes is actually too long. But I've also seen that in other situations where the court said 45 minutes was okay. So each each case is gonna be dependent on its own facts. Uh, there's one case that I, I, uh, I've been away, I've been with the Department of Justice for the past four years, and one of the cases that I had happened out near Sweetwater where they stopped a car, uh, and during that, he was, he was a subject of a drug investigation, and during that time, they asked him if they could search his car, and at that point, he said no, and the officers at that time wanted to get a, uh, a drug dog to come to the scene, to, to have the dog do what they call an open air sniff of the vehicle, and if the dog was to alert, that would give them a reason to be able to search the car. Well, it took them over an hour to get the dog uh, from Abilene to come and, and do the, the search of around the car with the dog, and you know I felt that was too long. So you know each case is going to have to depend on itself, but you know like you said, there's no bright line rule, and, it, and courts have said as, as, as little as 10 minutes could be too long. And I think a good, if we're going to capsulize it, would be as long as it takes to do the investigation. The initial stop. And if it goes beyond the, the, the length of time it takes to just to do the investigation, it's too long. Let me ask you all this, um, and, and anyone on our panel can answer. Can they put you in handcuffs while they, while they, do the, while they, while they have you detained? Yes. <clears throat> Why, though? Why? Well, they, for, for officer safety, but the officer, I mean, he doesn't have a, a, just a... a like to put somebody in handcuffs uh, during any type of uh, what we call temporary detentions or Terry stops. 
but the officer is going to have to articulate. They're going to have to state that you know there is a actual uh, objective reason as to why they want to put handcuffs on an individual during what is not an arrest, but just a, det a detention. And a lot of times, it's going to be based upon officer safety concerns. What's the difference between a de being detained and an arrest? What's the difference? Detained is just a temporary deal. It doesn't mean you're under arrest, but you could be in handcuffs during a detention. Uh, if you're arrested, that means you're going to be in custody and, and you're going to jail. So that's the, the difference between a detention and an arrest. Sir. Um, on a Terry stop like that, is the violator allowed to request a reasonable time frame? Can he give a time frame? They're going to be, the court, the judge. It just seems there's too much gray area there. Yeah. So the citizen or the violator can say, yes, uh, 15 minutes. They but can say it, but the cops don't have to follow that. They're not under any time constraints, and the citizen can't create a time constraint for that. Ms. Mitchell? I see. I see. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Why should, uh, and question two. Police can make the driver get out of the car. Why, for any reason, he stop you and ask you to get out of the car? I would just like to know the answer to that. Miss Mitchell, hold it. That's my next point. I'm gonna get to that. That's my that's my next one. <coughs> yes, ma'am. My question is, and it probably goes back to the first of your start of your meeting. I have a car, and my windows won't go down. And I take a chance, I don't know if I'm stopped and the officer is jittery or whatever. What do I do to assure this officer, if I'm stopped, I'm not dis distributing drugs, I'm not on drugs, I'm not buying drugs. If I'm stopped and I can't let, how do I get it over to the officer? I have my license, I have insurance, but my window won't go down. I'll, I'll let you, from the police perspective, that give you give you that. Yeah. Um, the, first of all, you, when you're when you're stopped, um, you your obligations only extend to what you're lawfully required to do at that point in time. You know how you convey to him. You know, hey, I can't roll down my window. Um, that's really not a, a, a legal thing. That's more of a human thing. Remember, the officer is is pulling you over. Now, he or she doesn't know you. They, they don't know anything about you. Uh, at least we can assume that. So they're walking up. What they're looking at and what they're looking for is expected normal responses. You know, expected normalcy. Uh, and so your actions, assuming they're within the realm of expected normalcy, will not trigger alarm on the part of the officer, or they should not. Is, you know, so you can't roll down your window. So you look and you go, you know, um, you know, and that's a kind of normal human interaction. And hopefully the person's gonna say, oh, okay, well, you know, look for traffic. We'll open your door a little bit, you know, because you've got to exchange that paper. Will that be giving him consent once you open the door for a search? No, that doesn't mean anything other than you have to communicate to complete the initial portions of the stuff. Hold on just a minute. Hold on to your question. Just a minute. Let me go on to the next part. Hold on to it. And if you don't mind, if you do, you have one of the cards, write it down for me. I want you to remember it, and we do want to get to it. I'm going to throw a couple of questions in here for time's sake for, for, for our family, right? Family and friends driving in the car. The police have stopped them. They stopped them for speeding. They pulled them over. Um, now the police officer says, get out the car. Can he make the driver get out the car? Yes. Can he make everybody get out the car? Yeah. Why? Because he's the police. <laughs> why? 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 Why can the police not only make the driver get out of the car? And, and, and can you give us the legal basis for it? Can you give us the legal basis and then the reasoning why they they can detain the driver and detain everyone in the car as well, or make them get out of the car? Well, I think it was what he was saying. It's all about their safety. Um, if you've only been stopped for speeding and there's no other suspicion and they make you get out of the car, it could be that there are weapons in the car for both driver and passenger. But if they were to search you more than that, it would require, um, if they were to do a pat down of any kind, it would require a suspicion that you did have a weapon of some sort. Hold on to that point, because I'm going to get to that one too. Yeah. <coughs> 
Here's what the court says, and here's what the court says too. When the police stop the driver, everybody in the car is detained. When the driver's detained, everybody in the car. And for the same reasons they said, but that, that's, that's, what, that's what the court has said, that's what the law says. So once the driver is stopped, you can't have a right to say, well, you can't tell me to get out or you can't do that because everybody at that point is then stopped who's in the car. <coughs> when they tell us to get out, attorney champion, they, can, can they pat you down? Not unless they have some additional suspicion. Right. You're trying to tell me that if they tell me to get out the car, right, and we've seen it, we all watch cops, yeah. right? Yeah. First 48. Cops right. is portrayed, right? Yeah. That they tell me to get out the car. And I, I get out the car, right? And then they say, this is for my safety, but they can't start patting me down like that, or they can't stick their hands in my pocket. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Because I don't believe it. That's not what I see, right? That's not what I think. So please give me something that tells me that what I think is right or wrong, because that's not what I see every day. They don't do that on cops. Where they do that at? Think, think about why there might be additional suspicion. If you're only stopped for speeding, then they're going to give you a you know, speeding ticket and that's it. But what if they're looking for someone that drives the same kind of car you're driving? What if you're acting extremely um, anxious and nervous? And yes, everybody's nervous when acting with authority figures, but to a point where it does give them additional suspicions coupled with, coupled with other circumstances, then they may say, okay, I should pat you down for my own safety. Can they stick their hands in my pocket to Eight. search? Somebody else can jump in. I don't want to dump <laughs> yeah, on a pat down frisk. I mean, officers in, in that initial pat down phase, no, they can't go into your pocket just as a matter of fact. Now, if they're patting you down and they, they feel something that feels like the outline of a weapon, a gun, a knife, at that point, yes, they can't go into to the pocket uh, or a jacket or whatever to pull that weapon out. For the, for, that doesn't mean you're going to jail. That just means for the, the time situation, for both the officer safety and the, the person that's being uh, uh, detained and patted down for, for that individual safety as well. Uh, for example, if they're petting down and they feel what, what they believe to be narcotics, they can also at that point uh, go into the pocket and retrieve narcotics. And, and what that's called is the plain feel doctrine. If they're able to, to uh, feel it without actually having to put their hand in a pocket and see what it is, then they're able to articulate that it's under the plain feel. But what if they don't stick their hand in my pocket? But what if they start trying to rub on my pants like that to see? Is that okay? Well, I think at that point you're getting a little bit more intrusive. I think again, you know, it's 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 very clear. It's a pat down. It's it's a feel. It's not to sit there and try to manipulate your pockets. Well, the way you do that is that they'll feel more what that uh, item is, and they're patting you down. But what I've seen uh, before, you know, when they start patching down, if they feel an item that's a little bit bulky, and they'll try to, they'll, you know, they'll do that to see what the item is. And then they'll ask you, because I've, I've, I've heard it from a couple of officers, they're friends of mine, and they'll ask them, you know, what, you know, what do they have in their pocket? Or do they have an eye for what is it? <coughs> Well, let me, ask, let me ask you all this. When the cops pull us over, because we've seen this, it's been in the news a lot lately, uh, Facebook, it's been in the news, where there's an attorney, right? He, is, he has on his car a window. I, I have the right to remain silent. I don't give you the consent to search my car. And I want to speak to my attorney before answering any questions. Is that OK? If, if you're being detained in a Terry stop, and the officer asks you for your name, you need to provide your name or you're going to be charged with failure to identify. Uh, so passenger? Right. That's not for passengers. Hold on, hold on, hold on, just a minute, hold on, just a minute. There's no constitutional right uh, to prevent the officer from knowing your name if you are temporarily detained uh, in a vehicle and you're the driver of that vehicle. I think the question over here is, well, what if you're the passenger of the car? Do you still have to give the identification? Again, that, that'll be another step in the analysis of what's going on. If you can develop another suspicion and that person's also the target of the, of the detention, yes, at that point in time, you can ask for that person's identification. I would assume you could. You just said that when, when somebody is pulled over, everybody, everybody, everybody in the vehicle is detained.
But unless you're driving, you don't have to carry an ID and provide it to people. Right, but you still have to provide the officer with your identification. Not unless you've been arrested. Hold on just a minute. Hold on just a minute, guys. And for time's sake, I'm going to go to you, sir. And then that'll probably be our last question until I go over the next points. But please hold your questions. I know you have good questions, and we do want to hear them. All right. And we're going to have a little bit more time for the Q&A to, to answer all of them, too. But you do have very good questions. Because this is what we all want to know. Right? We, this is what we all want to know. If the reasonable suspicion for the stop made the stop legal was the driver speeding, and there's no other reasonable suspicion, why would the passengers be a part of a speeding investigation when they're not behind the wheel? Therefore, why would they have to identify? There's a two-part process. You don't have an initial reasonable suspicion to get the passengers out. <coughs> It's a two-step process. You have to have a reasonable suspicion to stop. But if you get them all out of the car, under you're detaining them for officer safety, then all of a sudden they're detained under a Terry stop, and they can be charged criminally for not identifying at that point, though. Okay. We were told in the initial meeting by Bobby Bland that in the state of Texas, when a police officer gives you a command, you have absolutely no right. <laughs> To refuse the command. Well, let's 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 clear this up. Let's, 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 no, he told us that's no, no, no. A I, I, statement. I know what he said, but but let's, let's clear it because that's that's, that's somewhat a misleading. Lawful and this this is what Attorney Bland said because we were all. He said when an officer gives you the command that you're under arrest. No, at, no, 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 no. I'm telling you because I know because okay. Well, let me give you the law. Let me give you the law. All right. When an officer gives you the command that you're under arrest, at that point you cannot resist. You cannot resist because if you resist, he can use any force that is reasonable or necessary to effectuate the arrest. All right, that's 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 what the the law says almost to the letter. Once they give you the command that you're under arrest, you cannot you cannot then say no, I'm not, or you can't fight then because at that point you're then under arrest. And any effort to um, what about the like that or just prove that is, is uh, the officer that can use any force? What about right. the Supreme Court decision that says you do have the right to resist an unlawful arrest? So if I ask the officer, hold on, I, what I, know, am I, I know exactly what your question for, is, and he doesn't tell me a charge, then his arrest at that point is not lawful because he has not articulated a criminal act that I've been involved in. So I have every right. And the Supreme Court decision even says I have the right to use deadly force to resist him. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this, and I'm going to give you this from from the the, the the attorney perspective. All right, and this is from Attorney Norris. You're not going to find this in a book except the Book of Gavin, which is a good book. All right. Um, the law says this: you don't you don't have to comply with an unlawful command for arrest, right? If they're trying to arrest you and it's unlawful, you don't have to apply. That's what the law says. But but let's let's be what very. Chief say? What do you say bro brother, 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 we, brother, I, 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 please, Thank we you, respect you. Please no. respect me. Please respect. I'm trying to help you guys. Out. That's why we're doing this. So please, and, and, and the no, chief and everybody will get a chance. But please give give us the same respect that we give you. All right. Please, we we're, we're this is all of our volunteer time doing. It. It's all about volunteer time. And we want everybody to make sure that they understand this before they leave. As an attorney, I would never tell you if an officer says you're under arrest, even if it's an unlawful command, I would never tell you to actually physically try to uh, resist. Because the law says they can use any force necessary at that point. It doesn't mean you can't say, this is wrong, this is unlawful, I have a constitutional right. It doesn't mean that you can't say that. But as I as I said before, we need you to be alive, right? And and they can use whatever force necessary. And if unfortunately, God forbid, something happens to you because you were resisting, and it, it prevents you from being here to tell your story, they have the right to use the force in most cases. But we need you to be here to tell your story. Yeah. Well, we that's need you the to thing. be here to tell your. Hold These, on just a minute. Hold on just a minute. Okay. Hold, hold on to your questions because we are going to have the Q and A. We are going to have the Q and A. Okay. All right, we will have the Q and A. All right, we will get to that part. My passengers are hungry, so they No, no, y'all are detained. Y'all are detained. Y'all are detained. They don't have a if, if they pull you over, if they pull you over, if they pull you over, and Chief, if you, if you don't mind, we'll get to the Q&A. If you don't mind answering that question, please. <coughs> if they pull you over, can they then search the car 
or under what conditions and what circumstances can they then search the car? Um, or how about do is fleece? We'll, we'll, we'll go to you, fleece. Well, there's a couple of different, but well, I'll start with plain view. If they see something illegal in plain view, they can search the car. Yeah. What does plain view mean, though? It means I see it plainly. So you're saying if they go up to the car and right in the middle here, right, we got some sticky, some mar mar marijuana, Mary J, right, Kush, right, blow, right, whatever. We got all that stuff in there. You mean if they see it with their eyes, then they can search the car? If they see an open container of alcohol, an open, not, not, not to crush cans, right, the actual open container, they can then search the car then? Do I don't, you, what if I tell them, no, I don't want you to search the car? Based on Why? Because they've seen a crime that has been committed and they must investigate. What if they don't see anything? What if they don't see anything? They just pull up, right? They're here jamming out, right? They roll down the window and then there's some smoke. <laughs> right? They saw the smoke. They saw the smoke? They saw the signs. Can, can you that could be tobacco. What, can you cover what is legally that they can see, you know, the, the, like obviously marijuana, but and, and open containers of alcohol, but what about like prescription drugs or something like that along that line? That's a great question for our DAs. What is something that they can see, but it's not legally, it, what they see is not illegal? Mm -hmm. Where they can say, I want to search. They have to have probable cause to get. What I'm saying, what is it that they can? Well, for, 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 hold on, real quick. For our DAs, for our DAs. Well, I'm trying to keep the question as far as you're saying a scenario where you look in the car and it could be both have a legal purpose and an illegal purpose. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying like if if they say if I understand that you're saying it's got to be something that they see, but what if it's prescription drugs okay. or? The standard is it has to be readily apparent from a lawful vantage point, meaning the officer outside the car looking in knows without touching it, without doing anything with it, that it's illegal. So if it's so under the seat, like is that plain view? If you can see it from a lawful vantage point and it's in plain view and it's something that we all know is illegal, then yes, it's illegal. So they have to be able to see it. Am I getting to, to what, sure. you're, I what you're saying? saying, but, 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 saying what is it like, like a closed container, not an open <laughs> no. container of alcohol, closed? No, that, can't that, say that that's something that, you know, I got probably calls. Okay. Here we go. And just to speed this up, I want to give you a couple of reasons. Plain view, plain smell, if they smell it, are reasons to search without a warrant. And police do not need a search warrant to search your car. Here's what the law says. There are some, except normally, you need a warrant to do a search. That's a part of your Fourth Amendment constitutional right. Right? You, unreasonable search and seizure. But when it comes to a vehicle, there are some exceptions. And there's a reason why there's exceptions for the vehicle. Because at any point you could drive off and you could destroy the evidence. Or you could drive off and something could happen. So they don't have to, with probable cause, they have to be able to search. Is that How, knowledge that is available for us as people, as uh, individuals, is that knowledge that we can actually obtain what's obsessional or exceptional? You're talking about the, the exceptions to the warrant requirement? Yes, in um, the state of Texas. I mean, if so, where did we get that information? It would be the Code of Criminal Procedure and the Texas Penal Code. Okay, thank you. You could get on the, the Texas uh, legislature's website, uh, and on that, I think it's www. I'm not even going to try. Texas Ledge or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, but you can go on there, and it's got the Texas Penal Code, the Code of Criminal Procedure, and there's a part that says, you know, uh, warrantless arrest, and it shows you the exceptions. Uh, some of the like the automobile exception when like searching cars without a warrant, a lot of that is going to be case law, meaning it's going to be an opinion from a court, uh, and that those opinions, uh, you know, you can go to a, a library and, and access, uh, you know, cases and stuff like that. But it, it's a little bit more difficult on the case law to, to find the cases on something like the automobile exception. Okay, but as for <coughs> the Texas Penal Code mm -hmm. laws, those, yes, where do we as citizens? Get that. in Texas obtain that information. You could get that from, if you go to the Texas, if you just go to, to Google and you type in uh, State of Texas Legislature, okay. and you go there, there'll be a part where it says Texas Statute. And in the Texas Statutes, you'll have a, a drop down bill that has code of criminal procedure. Uh, pretty much any statute that the State of Texas has created, it'll be there and you'll be able to access it right there. 
without, without a book. And for, and for whatever reason you want to leave your home and not use technology, also the courthouse has a legal, a law library. And they have a law librarian who's very knowledgeable. You can tell her what you're looking for and she'll help you find it. If there's tons of books and it's right there for you to look at. However, the only problem that I have with that is that you only have access to it in the legal law library. Is there a place like your, say your library here in town, is there a place where I can go and check that book out and obtain that information from it's all of you? Go to the Hector County Courthouse uh, and go to the third floor. There's, a, there's a law library. Sense. And you can go in there and I, I believe you can check out the books there. I'm not because sure. Because I've got to check something out there before. So, but the third floor. To, to, to move this along and to, to make sure we respect your time, the other reason that police can, can search your car is consent. What is consent? They say, can I search your car? And you say, yes, yes, you can. You don't have to say yes, right? But if they, if they, if they ask you, but that is if you do give them consent, they can search your car, all right? Um, I'm gonna ask on this last part of this, if, if they pull us over, we're detained, right? All hungry and stuff, right? Ready for some leaky bees and all that stuff. If, can, can, they then search the tr can they then search the trunk of my car? Can they search the trunk of my car right there where they have me detained? They have probable cause to search the trunk. So can you give that to me? You kind of maybe give me an example of what probable cause might be for them to search my trunk? If you were somehow during the stop, uh, you developed that, that uh, one of the guys blurted out that there's drugs in the trunk. I mean, that would be enough probable cause there to be able to open the trunk. And when they search the car, can they search? Can they search my glove box? Can they search anywhere in my car? I mean, are there limits to where they can't search in my car? Well, for example, if they're looking for drugs or they're looking for a gun then they can search any part of the car that could conceal that, that type of matter. If you're looking for uh, something that, I'm just gonna throw out like a dog, for example. If it's a large dog, how, how would a dog be in a glove compartment? So you couldn't open the glove compartment to look for a dog, because obviously the dog's bigger in the glove compartment. And I use this example for, for my, my young legal legals in the room. If, if I'm suspected of stealing fishing poles from Walmart, can you check my, can you check my glove box because when I'm suspected of, of stealing fishing poles. Why not? Right, you can only search where there's possible that the evidence of the crime can be. All right, possible where the evidence of crime can be. I, got, I have one more here and then we'll turn it over to the chief. Um, if in the car there is something, and it's between all of us, right? It's between all of us no one claims possession. I don't know whose it is. I don't know whose it is. It's not mine. It's not mine. It's not mine. Can you arrest everybody? No. Yes. Why? Because it's going to be anybody. Somebody. Domain and control. Why? Why? Domain and control. It could be if you can reach it and you can exert control over it, it could be yours. <laughs> what See, so so how you come items aren't fingerprinted before the officer just reaches in and grabs it? Hold on, real to quick. Find one out guy who claims it and belongs. the other ones say it's not mine, it's not mine, it's not mine. Chief, we answer. And they arrest them all. Well, it depends on the circumstances, but no, one person expresses ownership over whatever the item is. No, unless there, are other, yeah, sorry, unless there are other articulable factors that relate to the other parties in the, in the cop. Um, so if everybody denies it, then everybody's got a problem. If one guy says it's mine, and everybody agrees that guy's got a problem. Everybody's got a problem. Chief, do you mind someone said they couldn't hear you? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, if, if an item is in, is in a cop, it's in, it's in proximity to everyone. And everyone can exercise control over it. And that represents something that's illegal. Then everybody can get arrested because everybody can control whatever it is that is the source of the illegality. If the officers through investigation are able to determine that whatever the illegality is, is one person's that person actually exercises control through ownership, then it's that person that has the, the issue with the law. 
and the other people, at least in the, the at least in this hypothetical, have denied responsibility for the item. That's the officer's conclusion. Therefore, those people are not responsible. Is that the same for if it's a minor? That maybe is one of the minor. Is a minor in the group? <coughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same. If if this is this is our last one, and I'm turning over to the chief to talk to you guys in, in your presentation, chief. Um, if the police pulled us over, we were speeding, but we were kind of weaving while we were speeding. All right, we were weaving while we were speeding, and, and he pulled us over under suspicion of DUI or DWI. He tells us to get out the car. He asks us to do a breathalyzer test. If we refuse to do a breathalyzer test, what does the law say to our attorneys? What does the law say if in Texas if you refuse if you refuse a breathalyzer test? Well. One example would be, I mean, you have the right to refuse a drug test. There may be consequences to refusing, which could end up with the uh, suspension of your license uh, when you refuse. Uh, also, if you refuse, that doesn't mean that the investigation necessarily would stop. At that point in time, an officer could uh, go to a judge, uh, draft a probable cause affidavit, and get a uh, search warrant for your blood, and at that point, uh, get a blood sample. We generally say Texas is a no refusal state, which means that even if you refuse, they are going to draw your blood. I'm going to stop there from this perspective because I'd like the chief to talk about it a little bit more. To our volunteers, thank you. You may, you may go back or go eat. Thank you. All that you said that they'll draw your blood, you the officer does that? No, I'm going to let the chief explain that. But the officers don't. But, chief, if you'll explain, and even your new policy right now regarding the app and everything for the search, for the search warrants and all that stuff. Um, let me, uh, okay, then I'll go back to the other question you wanted to ask. Sure, please. After. Uh, in, in terms of being able to refuse a blood alcohol test in various forms, I mean, you can say no. You can say, no, I'm not going to allow you to take my breath or to take my breath. However, uh, what the law does provide, just like in any other circumstance, if the officer has articulable probable cause, they can draft an affidavit. <coughs> get a judge to sign a warrant, and then they can compel you to give your blood. They can make you do it uh, in order to determine blood alcohol. Most recently, we have become a no-refusal county. What that means is you get stopped for DWI, and you say, I'm not taking any tests. And the officer says, well, that's okay. Uh, that, that's, that's fine. I mean, you, you know, your eyes are bloodshot. I can smell booze everywhere. You can barely stand up. You know, you're detained, I'm going to write my affidavit, it goes to the judge regardless of time of day, the judge reads it, if the judge approves, then a warrant is issued to take your blood. Is that in live time, you say? That's in live time, that's all done over the computer, it happens uh, right from the field. You're then transported to the jail where medical staff does the blood draw. The arrest is completed, that blood is retained as evidence of the DWI and ultimately analyzed to determine blood alcohol content. Uh, so that's what happens with that one. Um, to, to answer the prior question very quickly, it was about unlawful arrest and use of force for unlawful arrest. Police officers cannot break the law in the course of enforcing the law. They're not allowed to break the law. However, what they are allowed to do is be wrong. They can be wrong, they just can't purposefully break the law. So if a police officer is going to arrest you and you say, geez, I haven't done anything wrong, you know, this is illegal. Well, you have to remember that you know what you know, that you haven't done anything wrong, but you don't know what the police officer knows. He or she may be functioning under the belief that because of the description that you fit, because of any number of factors, he's convinced, he has probable cause at that point to believe you're the person that committed that crime. That's not illegal. He may be wrong, but it's not illegal. If, for example, <coughs> it, he chooses you at random, and just says, I'm arresting you just because I feel like it, well, that's against the law. The trouble is, you don't know whether that's what he's doing or not. Uh, however, if that is what he's doing, that clearly is against the law, and that's a violation all over the place. Uh, so, 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Could I ask a simple question? Mm -hmm. and, and just a straightforward answer. Mm -hmm. DA Bobby Bland said, if a police officer gives you a direct command, whatever it is, you have no right to refuse to, uh, to follow his command. Well, I, I can't speak for the DA because I don't remember exactly what he said. Your officer. If one of your yeah. officers were to give me a direct command, whatever it is, it, in the state of Texas, do I have a right to refuse anything he tell me to do? You have a right to do nothing. You can always do nothing. nothing. In other words, if I say to you, hey, I want you to stand in the corner, you, know, you can just say, well, no. I'm just standing here. Now, that might get you arrested. That's what but, I'm, that's. But, that's but, the officer better be right. He has to justify but that. But I'm arrested. Action. After, we find out I was right after, but I'm arrested. Well, yeah, I mean, yes. That's, that's if he's that's, wrong. That's my answer. I need yeah. it. Thank you. But if he, you can't, you, you can't account for wrongful behavior. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Course. Wrongful yes, behavior is wrongful behavior. Yes, sir. Whether yes, a policeman sir. does it or whether a regular person does it. Yes, sir. Uh, so you know you can't you can't uh, you can't undo the arrest. It's right. Done. Well, you can't undo the arrest, but you can certainly take punitive action against the guy that affected the arrest when he didn't have cause to do so. Can we piggyback on that a little bit more? Where let's say. When we've seen where someone might be videoing a police officer that's doing something wrong, they may be harassing somebody, and then they turn around and can they harass the person that's videotaping it? Because like he's saying, if he, if he gives him a command yeah. and he says no because he's not doing anything wrong, but then, like you said, that's not going to keep you from getting arrested because right. you can still get arrested, but then you have someone that's videotaping it, then suddenly they're <coughs> caught in it. Uh, the is answer, there, does that person have any rights or? Sure, the, the answer is that you can video whatever you want to video. Uh, we, we video ourselves. Uh, you just can't physically interfere with the actions of the officer. You can stand there and video okay. whatever you want. Thank you, thank you. We have a, uh, we have a uh, presentation. You need the lights off here? Yeah, let me go. Yeah, let me go. Can you? These lights back here. I'll let them go. Is that pretty good? Is that good enough? Can everybody see it? Yes. Who's going to talk? Who's going to talk? It talks itself. Okay, turn it up loud so everybody can hear. <laughs> Thank you. In violation of a city ordinance. A request by another officer to stop a vehicle based on the other officer's reasonable and articulated suspicions. Violation of federal laws. A safety violation or concern, knowledge of an existing warrant of arrest for the driver or passenger, or when there is probable cause to believe that the vehicle contains either evidence of or a person involved in a crime. The initial stop. Officers will activate emergency lights and notify dispatch of location and vehicle description. If a citizen appears to not see them, then the officer may activate his siren. Citizens are required by state law to pull over in a safe area within a reasonable amount of time. Racial profiling laws require that the interaction be recorded by dash cam cameras with audio recording as well. The approach. The officer will approach either the driver's side of the vehicle or the passenger side of the vehicle based on the officer's discretion. The officer will be inspecting the vehicle as he approaches for anything that might be unsafe or illegal. At night, officers will light up the vehicle with bright lights to see the top of the Traffic unit. Interactions. The officer does not know you, so keep your hands visible. The driver should communicate movements to the officers, such as Officer, I'm reaching for my driver's license or insurance. It is located in the back pocket, in the glove box, under the seat, 
in the council, etc. If you want to be pulled over, you only uh, stop.